Chainmail is a set of medieval miniature war game rules designed by Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin in the late 1960s. However, despite its long-standing influence, the two designers didn't exactly see eye to eye on the most famous aspect of the rule set known as the fantasy supplement. This supplement would figure prominently in the development of Dungeons and Dragons, or D&D for short, the world's first published and beloved role-playing game. The origin story of Chainmail starts uh, in the basement, as all good D&D stories do. Uh, in, in the 1960s, Henry Bodenstedt ran a hobby supply business in Freehold, New Jersey, called Continental Hobby Supplies. The company carried miniatures imported from the Hauser Company in West Germany. Uh, these 40 millimeter and 70 millimeter pre-painted plastic miniatures branded Elastilin would be the central miniature figures used for chainmail. In, in order to encourage sales of these figures, Henry created the Siege of Bodenburg, a war game requiring a vast number of Elastilin figures, over 200. The scenario centers around a large model castle, Castle Bodenburg. It is defended by Count von Boden and his armored knights against a horde of invaders with Mongol spearmen, horse archers, swordsmen, catapults, ladders, and, and siege equipment. It not only drove hobbyists to buy his period figures, but it also encouraged sales of similarly scaled castles, scenery, and other buildings. Though the game was immensely fun and had spectacular visual appeal, it would take a few years before Henry is able to publish The Siege of Bodenburg, uh, and he does so in the fledgling wargaming magazine Strategy and Tactics. Eventually, Henry refines the rules into a little digest-sized rulebook, Siege of Bodenburg, that he distributes liberally. In August of 1968, Gary Gygax, a, a co-founder of the wargaming club, the International Federation of Wargaming, or IFW, hosts the first ever Geneva Convention or Gen Con Wargaming Convention. It is held in a local garden club facility, the Horticultural Hall in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, where nearly 100 people attend from all over the country. One attendee, Jerry White, travels all the way from Portland, Oregon, with this beautiful collection of Lastolin figures and accompanying castle to play Siege of Bodenburg. Gary Gygax participates in that game and is immediately enthralled with the figures and castle. So much so that after the convention was officially ended, when they were supposed to be putting up chairs and sweeping, Gary and others continued to play the game, occasionally sending out someone to pretend to sweep as a lookout. From that point on, Gary's fascination with the medieval period inspired him to create a war game around it, one that ultimately used the beautiful Elastolin figures. Just two months later, a 13-year-old boy named Robbie Kuntz meets Gary Gygax for the first time. Gary takes young Robbie under his wing, bringing him into the hobby and his home. Together, they help form the Lake Geneva Tactical Studies Association, or LGTSA, with Don Kay, a childhood friend of Gary's, and a few others. This local wargaming club would regularly play miniature games on Gary's dining room table at 330 Center Street in Lake Geneva. Early in 1969, Gary Gygax writes in the IFW's monthly fanzine, International Wargamer, there is great interest in war games of ancient and medieval times, but few games are published. He becomes intent on creating a set of rules for a medieval miniature war game. Later that year, at Gen Con 2, Gary meets Dave Arneson, a, a war gamer and college student from the Twin Cities in Minnesota the two would eventually become friends and collaborators. Sometime in the summer of 1970, Gary builds this six foot by 10 foot sand table in his basement. Local gamers and those in the surrounding area flock to Gary's house to play on the table. However, the group still does not have the Elastalin figures they want in order to play their medieval miniature war games. By October of 1969, the LGTSA, according to Gary, had four to six usual and three to five occasional players. And they've been collecting dues to raise enough money to make a big order of a few hundred Elastalin figures. However, the pre-painted figures are 50 cents each and will cost a significant amount of money to purchase in mass. While waiting to raise even more funds to purchase the remaining Elastalin armies, Jeff Perrin, a co-owner and manager of Royal Hobby in Rockford, Illinois, joins the LGTSA 
and offers to let the group use his collection of several hundred figures in the meantime. I then went up to 330 Center Street and visited with him and saw what he was into and big sand table there and I said, hey, you gotta get into miniatures here with this kind of thing. You don't own cats, so the sand table has to be used for something. And the game did, evolved through uh, his work with uh, the local Lake Geneva Tactical Association uh, with, with Chainmail. And Chainmail was my rules that I wrote for a collection of figures that I owned at the time that uh, later on I sold him, quote, sold him the collection, and that beca those became the miniatures that you see in the book Chainmail and that most of the battles were, early battles were fought in. The LGTSA began using these rules, adding a few elements of Gary's original ancient medieval miniatures rules and, and expanding them as the need arose during gameplay. Gary was easy, he'd, he'd try anything because he was of that mind, he, mindset. He'd look at him and we'd, we'd play it and uh, either he'd, he'd uh, condemn it or play it, <laughs> you know, again, you know, that sort of thing. But he, he was a gamer, a, ga a gamer, a gamester, a designer. He'd try anything, at least once. And Chainmail, he, he liked that. and nobility, knight, baron, duke, that sort of thing. One of these contributing members, Dave Arneson, writes articles for the Domesday Book and starts drawing up coats of arms with the society's herald, Bill Linden. On July 1st, the rules were further refined and published again in the Domesday Book as the LGTSA miniature rules. But weeks later, the Castle and Crusade Society had 31 members and the rules were re-edited and published yet again in the Sparta International Wargame fanzine in August. The rules were becoming so widespread that they were starting to gain a following. That gained the attention of Don Lowry, who was starting a small press publishing house named Guide On Games. A meeting with Don Lowry at Gen Con 3 that August opened the door for Gary Gygax to professionally publish his games, including his set of medieval miniature rules. He said, let's take these rules and publish them. The thought hadn't occurred to me. You know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't in, in the rules marketing department, but at the time there was a company in Belfast, Maine called Guidon Games, which uh, Gary sold the rules to, at which time it was called Chainmail. 
and it was published by Guidon. In the late fall of 1970, the Castle and Crusade Society members continue to play the medieval miniature rules as Gary continues to tinker with them. He then reads about a short set of miniature rules for Middle Earth Battles, published in the November issue of The Courier, another wargaming fanzine, which he thinks would be fun to adapt his fantasy elements to his medieval miniature rules. According to him, the guys were getting a little tired of military miniatures, so one day I put a troll under the bridge. Well, they loved it. They absolutely went crazy for it. He edited the rules as I wrote them. I wrote the first half. I, I covered the historical aspects, the combat charts, etc. He did touch-ups here and there. He added the jousting matrix and this and that, but added the whole section on dragons and wizards and stuff like that, which I looked upon with abhorrence, saying, what is that? <laughs> It was like totally unheard of in, in the hobby at the time. And we tried a game or two with it, and it was, it was fun. But it was out, outside of the realms of history that I was comfortable with. Gary's love for fantasy and science fiction ignites his imagination. And he types nearly 20 pages of manuscript and calls it the Fantasy Supplement, a section of rules for conducting fantastic battles, such as those found in fantasy literature. The popularity of the fantasy supplement sweeps through the members of the LGTSA and the Castle and Crusade Society like wildfire. They enthusiastically play test it well into the spring. Finally, after weeks of designing the rules, writing and editing the fantasy supplement, Gary mails Don Laurie his final draft of Chainmail, now nearly 60 pages long. While Gary Gygax is working on this, Dave Arneson has been cooking up something of his own. Dave and his group of gaming buddies in the Twin Cities have been developing their own games, where players would take on the role of individual characters in a limited war game scenario called Bronsteins, all started by Arneson's friend, David Wesley. On April 17th, Arneson takes the concept further and uses his Northern Marches map for a medieval version he refers to as Blackmore. Dave announces his event in his gaming club newsletter, Corner of the Tabletop, as a medieval Bronstein, and, and that it will feature mythical creatures and a poker game under the Trolls Bridge between sunup and sundown. By the spring of 1972, Chainmail had been vastly expanded by Gary for a second edition and would be reprinted four times over the next two years. It proved incredibly popular with the war game crowd, and fans began extolling its virtues, especially the fantasy supplement. Len Lakofka, an inveterate wargamer and president of the IFW, stated, absolutely superb set of rules, playable and enjoyable. The fantasy supplement using hobbits, elves, orcs, superheroes, wizards, and dragons, plus many more, is utterly delightful. The imagination and gift of the authors produce a true work of genius, and mirth to the player. At last, some fun for the wargamer. Fantasy wargaming is a liberation for hundreds of fans. Now they can create from their imagination and are no longer encumbered by what older, serious wargamers think. They are free to express their imaginations. It's only a hint of what's to come. Meanwhile, 16-year-old King Robert I attempts to rejuvenate the Castle and Crusade Society and he and his brother Terry mail out 80 copies of Domesday Book Number 12 to old, new, and prospective members in June of 1972. However, in July, when Domesday Book Number 13 is published, the issue would turn out to be the last of the Domesday books. That issue did, however, feature a fantasy campaign description and a detailed map of Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. The end of the Domesday books essentially closed the door on the Castle and Crusade Society, but a new one opened to the next evolution of gaming. By October of that year, Dave Arneson's Blackmore games had been going on for about a year and a half with his gaming group in the Twin Cities. Uh, they use many elements of the war game Chainmail, but what Dave Arneson has created is not a variant of Chainmail, but an entirely new sort of game, the first role-playing game. Uh, of course, Gary Gygax was kept abreast of the Blackmore games by phone calls and letters and Dave's newsletter, Corner the Tabletop. Dave explains the game in terms they both understand. 
uh, they use certain rules from the Napoleonics game Strategos N, uh, certain portions of Chainmail, even the game Diplomacy, and various other things. But they both decide the best way to understand the game is for Gary to play it himself. So in November, Gary invites Dave Arneson and Dave McGarry to come to Lake Geneva to show both the Blackmore game and McGarry's board game Dungeon. That night, with Gary, his son Ernie, and Rob and his brother Terry, all play Dave McGarry's Dungeon board game. And then Arneson runs a Blackmore adventure with the group. Uh, immediately, Gary wants to know more about Blackmore. Uh, is it a rule set he can publish? He asks Arneson for his rules, and later he says he receives 18 pages or so of handwritten notes for Blackmore. Gary then begins rewriting Dave's handwritten rules uh, into what he calls the fantasy game, uh, as a working title, of course, uh, and completes a draft by the spring of 1973. Gary Gygax and Don Kay establish tactical studies rules on October 1st with the intent of publishing the fantasy game as Dungeons and Dragons. And in January of 1974, TSR releases Dungeons and Dragons, the world's first published role-playing game. Among the recommended additional equipment to play the game, in addition to dice, paper, and pencils, was a copy of Chainmail. Indeed, Gary had lifted a large majority of Chainmail directly into Dungeons and Dragons. They used the rules to play the paper and pencil game Dungeons and Dragons. So as a result, I knew it was a tool for it, but this was before it skyrocketed in sales. It was fortunate for Chainmail that in order to play the game, you had to buy the three books and Chainmail in order to play the game. And that's when I began to see the possibility. It's when, when TSR sales started to quadruple every quarter, it just say, this, this could be something big. Chainmail, while useful in understanding some of the esoteric elements of D&D, wasn't really necessary to play D&D. Uh, in fact, in a few short years, Chainmail is no longer recommended uh, as an accessory to the game, and it's not even a TSR product at the time. But Chainmail at that time was still a Guidon product, Guidon Games. Gary didn't buy the rights from Don Lowry at Guidon until uh, about a year later so that he could be the publisher, and it became a TSR product. And as Dungeons & Dragons grows, uh, so did TSR. And they began expanding their line of games, uh, eventually acquiring several titles from Guidon Games, uh, including Chainmail, which is then revised for a third edition. This edition of Chainmail received seven printings and an eighth printing that was reprinted regularly in runs of 500 from 1980 until the late 1980s. Chainmail, while copyrighted, was never trademarked. Jeff Perrin, however, still had all the rights and author royalties on the title until 2009. Uh, originally, the split was 60-40, but in the end, Jeff ended up with all the author royalties after Gary Gygax transferred his 60% to Jeff as a favor for forgiving a debt. That was the bargain. He wanted to buy the Elastalin collection, the figurines I had. And I said, sure, you can have them, because by then I was collecting a lot of the lead miniatures, and basically the Middle Ages was starting to bore me. Even with chain mail, I said, okay, that's fine, these are nice rules. <clears throat> About a year or two later, I wasn't even playing the damn game. <laughs> so I got rid of the collection to Gary, because those guys could use them. And Gary was paying, paying me some time payments. I gave him the collection in return. He said he would give me his share of any profits from Chainmail for, you know, future sales. Despite the two authors not seeing eye to eye on the value of the fantasy supplement, their work on Chainmail and all its editions would prove to be seminal in the creation of Dungeons and Dragons, a, a game that continues in its popularity even today. The way that went. Now, by that time, they were running Dungeons and Dragons with a different set of rules. So in other words, Chainmail was not being used as a part of the basic game. So the sales there went down. That part, a little disappointing, but I, I know they had to update the, the rules. But when asked if they were ever going to drop Chainmail off the list or get rid of it or sell the rights back or whatever, Kevin Bloom said, no, we'd never sell chain mail because that was their 
good old 2002 number that that was a flagship for the for the company he, he said we'll keep that in 2006 the legends of wargaming staged a castle and crusade society reunion and chainmail game including former society members gary gygax jeff perrin ernie gygax rob kuntz bill hoyer john bobeck and jim lurie every year since chainmail games continue to be played at GaryCon in the Legends of Wargaming room, often run by original LGTSA and Castle and Crusade Society members. Among these events is the annual GaryCon Jousting Tourney. This event uses the Chainmail Jousting rules and has 100 participants. It was even played at Gen Con 50 on the 50-yard line of the Indiana Colts football stadium. On this, the 50th anniversary of Chainmail, we recognize all of the people who designed, tested, published, and supported the game, and the thousands that enjoyed playing it and continue to enjoy playing it to this day. Ultimately, Chainmail's greatest contribution is that it brought together a group of creative dreamers who loved the idea of medieval knights, dragons, wizards, and heroic fantasy. Together, they broke the paradigm of wargaming and opened the door for millions of creative young minds to expand their horizons. <laughs>